All right, so for this part of the course now, I said, I talked about a little bit about, about this uh, in the networking class before we had uh, spring break, um, but we're now in the course of the semester, we've gone now back to the top of our conceptual database system, and now the lectures going forward, we're, we're going to go down the stack again, and now let's talk, talk about how we actually execute queries. So the lectures before this, we were talking about how actually we store the database. Right, storage models, compression, indexes. Um, and now we're going back around and talk about how queries are actually going to execute query on, on, the, on this data. And the reason why, again, why I front loaded the, the semester to talk about concurrency control and query compilation is because we want to, again, be, be thinking about these things all throughout the semester as we, as we talk about our various things we're doing. So in this class, we're going to talk about now how do we actually build a uh, query optimizer. Right? How do we take a SQL query from the application and generate a query plan for it that's efficient and be able to execute it. So we're going to start talking off about a high-level background about the high-level things that we care about uh, in, a, in a query optimizer and what, what query opti optimization actually means. And then we'll talk about the di different the design decisions at a high level that we're going to need to have when we implement our query optimizer. What things do we need to care about um, and what, what, how we can actually implement things. And then we're going to spend most of our time talking, though, about the search strategies. So the paper I had you guys read uh, was a master's thesis from the 1990s, which seems kind of a, a weird thing for me to assign you, but that thing is actually the best uh, description of the Cascades optimization framework that I can find anywhere, right? Uh, if you read the original Cascades paper, it's, it's a bit dense uh, and it doesn't, it's not really clear. So Cascades is a, is, a, is a search strategy, but there's a bunch of other ones that we're going to talk about as well. So this will be, I'll talk about sort of the history of these search strategies and what people have implemented, and that'll get you guys to understand why the Cascades model, in my opinion, the unified search model is, is one of the best approaches to do this, because you'll see why the other ones are insufficient. And then on Monday's class next week, we'll actually spend more time to actually talk about uh, how Cascades actually works and how you implement it, because this is what, what we use in our system. Okay? All right, so I shouldn't have to define this, but everyone should, should understand, understand what it means to do query optimization, but we, just, we can talk about it a little bit. The basic idea is, again, the application is giving us a query in a declarative language, meaning they're telling us what query, they, what, you know, what the result is that they want, and it's up for us to figure out how to generate a query plan that actually compute that. So for a given query, we want to find a correct execution plan that has the lowest cost. And in this opening sentence here, I'm emphasizing the two words correct and cost. So correct means that the database system produces the answer that the, that the, the, the person wants with the query, right? It doesn't help us if we have, uh, we generate a query plan that may be the fastest thing in the world, but if it comes back with the wrong results, then it's essentially useless for us. Now I talked a little bit about, about approximate query processing when we talked about compression earlier. It's a way to give an approximate answer rather than the exact one. That's a totally different area uh, it's, it's sort of related to this uh, in that it's not correct, but the user is telling the database system, I, do, I, I don't care if you're not correct. And, and most of the time, when someone gives us a query, they want the correct answer. All right, so we need to make sure we find a plan that, that generates one. And then I'm putting cost here in quotes because the cost is going to be a relative term that will be used internally by the database system um, to help us figure out what, what our execution strategies are. And it depends on the operating environment that the system is running in or the application is running in uh, will determine what our cost actually is, right? If we're on a disk-based system, it's obviously how many pages or blocks we read from disk. If we're on an in-memory system, it might be the number of tuples we read. But if, but if we're in a distributed system, then it might be how much data do we send or read over the network. Um, and if we're running on a mobile phone, then it's how much energy the query is using. So the, execute, the search strategies that we'll be talking about today are independent of the cost, um, and that's something you define in the cost model that the optimizer uses, which we'll talk about in more detail uh, Wednesday next week. So I will say that the query optimization is, the, is, is, is widely regarded as the hardest thing to actually implement well in a database system. Right? The problem itself, how do you take a query plan and generate the optimal, uh, how do you take a query and generate the optimal plan for it, is known to be NP-complete. Now, for real simple queries, it's not that big of a deal, but when you start talking about 75-way joins, or joining 75 tables, then uh, you start to have problems. So because the search space is, uh, is non-polynomial, 
no optimizer is actually going to ever really produce the optimal query plan for a particular query. Right? Instead, we're going to use a bunch of techniques that we'll talk about today that can apply our domain knowledge about database, databases and applications to come up with a way to, to, to not have to do you know, uh, an exhaustive search over everything. Right? We want to try to limit the search space. And likewise, because we want to, we want to figure out what the, plan, the cost it is for a query plan before we actually start running the query, we have to come up with a way to estimate what the, the real cost is going to be. Right? Again, this is the cost model stuff we'll talk about later. So at a high level, query optimization sort of looks like this. Right? So you have your application. They submit a SQL query uh, to the database system. And in the first stage, you could do uh, what's called SQL rewriting, where you basically have rules that take the, raw, the, the, the SQL string that the application gave you, and you could do some additional conversion on it to, to put it into a different form. Right? Uh, this is op optional. As far as I know, most systems don't actually do this. Right, but this is something you could do if, say, you want to rewrite something just based purely on SQL, uh, you can do this. This appears mostly in like middleware systems or proxies where you want to rewrite the table name to, 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 to put it to a real table name, uh, like, a, like a, a logical name to a physical name. All right, so then we take our SQL query, we run that through our SQL parser, uh, and then this is going to spit out essentially a, a, a logical plan that's comprised of the abstract syntax tree. Right? So it's just basically taking all the tokens that are that it, that's in your SQL string and then converting them into a form that the that that's that's decipherable by the database system, like a tree structure. And then we run this through the binder, and the binder is basically now going to take all the, the SQL strings, sorry, the, the strings of names of things that you're referencing in your SQL query, and will map them to the internal identifiers that the database system uses to keep track of tables and columns. Right? If I'm doing a query, select star from table foo. The binder would then look up in the catalog and say, give me the, the internal ID for the table with the name foo. And then it annotates the, the, the logical plan, the AST, now with that table ID and that, that it can use to again look up in memory or find the actual object it wants to operate on. Then in the next phase, you have what's called a tree, tree rewriter or an expression rewriter. And this is where you can do additional optimizations that are static, things like rules to rewrite the, the query plan by operating directly on, on, the, on the AST rather than the SQL statement. Right? The, the team last, last Monday that was presenting, uh, that presented their work on the optimizer, they talked about doing rewriting of expressions right? to, to extract out the, uh, the AND clause that was redundant in a, in a disjunction. So that's essentially what, what you do this here. Right? But this is optional. You don't actually need to do this, and you can still uh, optimize the query. And then the thing that we're focusing on here is now the query optimizer. So this is going to be a combination of accessing the the catalog to know, get information about what your table looks like, and then it has a cost model to produce estimates about what it thinks the execution time or, or uh, storage overhead of executing query will be, chooses the best plan, um, and then spits that out for execution. So now when we talked about the code gen and the query, op uh, the, the, the query compiler stuff, that essentially would happen here. So the query compiler has to take in a physical plan that the optimizer spits out, and then it can compile executable code. Right, so we're focusing on this class. We're focusing on, on this piece here. So the first thing we got to talk about is the distinction between logical plans and physical plans, because this is going to come up all throughout, throughout the lecture. So you can think of the logical plan as the high-level operations, right, almost like think of like relational algebra operators that describe what the query is, is supposed to do. I want to join table A and B. Right? It doesn't say anything about how you actually do that join. It just says, I want to, you know, the query says, I want to do it. And then what's going to happen is in our optimizer, it's going to try to generate a, a optimal equivalent physical plan for a logical plan. Right? So if I want to do a join on A and B, the logical plan would say, just do join A and B. But then the physical plan would say, do a hash join on A and B or do a hash join on B and A. Right? And so what will happen is, Sometimes a, a single log logical operator could get exploded into multiple physical operators, and then the reverse can happen. Multiple logical operators can get coalesced into a single physical operator. Right? So say like my query plan wants to do a, a join and then followed by a, a, an order by on the, the, the key that I'm, I'm joining the two tables on. Well, that, that would be two logical operators in relational algebra, but in my physical operator, I could do a sort merge join 
uh, that would then combine together those two logical operators into a single physical operator and it would produce the same output. Right? So it's not always going to be a one-to-one -one mapping from a logical to physical. Um, it depends on what, what we're actually trying to do. And a key thing that's going to show up later on when we see, start motivating why we want to use cascades or uh, the starburst method is that the, what operator you're allowed to, to, to convert or transform a logical operator, what physical operator you're allowed to convert a logical operator into could depend on what the data actually looks like. Right? So if the data needs to be sorted, if the data is, we expect the data to be compressed, these are the kind of things we need to, need to be mindful of in our physical plan, right? Well, we don't care about in the logical plan because it doesn't know anything about you know, the, how the data is actually laid out, right? Because you know, relational algebra doesn't, doesn't deal with these things. So one of the things we're going to be able to exploit uh, to make these, our query optimization stuff work is the fact that there are certain equivalencies uh, that we can rely on in relational algebra that will allow us to transform a, uh, a logical plan, one logical plan to another logical plan, and be guaranteed that they're, they're going to always can produce the same result. Right? We can rely on the commutativity property of relational algebra to say, if I join B and C, and take the output of that join and join A, well, that's going to be equivalent to joining A and C first, and then taking that output and joining A. So we can rely on these properties, associativity, commutativity of relational algebra, to again, infer whether we're actually generating a, a correct, correct result. Now, the, the physical operator stuff will be important later on. Like, again, if my output needs to be sorted, I need to make sure my data en ends up being sorted. So real quick, before we start going in, in, into the weeds on these things, the one thing I want to say real quickly is that uh, for all OTP applications, query planning or query optimization is actually really easy. And this is because most of the queries in an OTP application are we known what is called sargeable, which stands for uh, search argument able. Somebody made it up in the 80s. Just, just go with it, okay? And so the reason why query planning is really easy or, or much easier to do in OTP environments is because most of the time the queries are sargeable, meaning you, you can figure out exactly the one, the one index you need to use in order to execute that query. Right? Most of the OTP applications are going to you know, be something like select star from table, uh, where ID equals one, two, three, and there'll be an index on, on, on that uh, ID column. So all you need to do is look in the where clause and say, oh, I'm doing an equality predicate on the ID clause, and I have an index on the ID, on the, on the ID column. So that's the one index I want to use. And I don't, I don't need to do an exhaustive search or look at join orders and things like that, right? So they, these type of queries are much, easy, are much easier to deal with, right? In the case, if you do have some joins, they're almost always going to be on foreign key relationships, right? Uh, select Andy's customer account and join it with the orders table with all the orders he's purchased. Right? There's going to be a, there's going to be an index on the foreign key inside the orders table. So I just pick that and do a nested loop join, and it's really easy to do. Right? And the way we can implement this is with really simple heuristics. And this is what pretty much what most people do when they start building a new database system. This is what everyone starts off with when they build a new uh, query optimizer. Right? Because it, it works reasonably well for OTP. So in this lecture, the next lecture, and, and when we talk about cost models, we're really focusing on OLAP queries that are way more complex, and it's not super obvious exactly here's going to be this one index I want to use. Because, as we saw this in the case of TPCH, there aren't going to be indexes that we can use for our queries. So now we've got to figure out other things, uh, we, we need to, uh, other tricks we can do to, to optimize our queries. I talked about this uh, a couple times already. Um, but cost estimation is going to be a big, big part of making sure our query optimizer works. So we can have the most fancy search strategy or search algorithm we could want, but if our cost model is crap, then it's going to generate crap plans, right? And the reason why we have to estimate what the, what the execution time is for a query is because it'd be too expensive for us to uh, try out every single one uh, and then see, see which one actually works out the best. Now, this is actually what MongoDB does, at least as of, as of last year. They might have changed it. Uh, but they didn't actually didn't really have a cost-based query optimizer. They would generate every query plan, execute one, see how long it took to come back, try it a couple, couple times, and then try other ones. And whichever one is the fastest, they just end up using that. And for operational workloads, that's in like OHP stuff, that's probably good enough. Right? right? Because the, cause the, the otherwise, you need to have a cost model that allows you to estimate uh, what the system thinks is going to do or the cost of executing that query. So it depends on a whole bunch of different things, right? Depends on what other queries or background jobs are running the system the time, the, the moment you're running. Depends on the 
The amount of data each operator is going to spit out or emit uh, as it computes depends on what algorithms or access methods like indexes uh, you're, you're going to have, how much resources you're going to use, what the data actually looks like. Right? You need to consider all these things potentially in order to generate a accurate cost model. Yes? Why would it not for MongoDB to run like server scans and choose the one with the lower cost? I mean, like, the <laughs> still vary. Wait, say it again? So, so, like, why would it not for MongoDB to, like, just pick the one with the lower cost? It's like, it's a dynamic stuff. So his question is, why is it okay for MongoDB to uh, just do the sort of uh, a basic search algorithm where you just pick one query plan, run it, see how long it takes, keep track of that, and then maybe try another one and see if that gets any faster. Why is it okay for doing that? So one, up until very, very recently, they didn't support joins, right? So it really just has to do with picking what index to use and maybe what, uh, you know, how to, to, and they didn't really do shuffles either, right? So Index selection, right? That would be the simplest one to do this. The reason is their like, workloads generally are not really complicated. Or... Yeah, so your MongoDB's workloads up until recently were, were quite simple, right? Doing a lookup on something on, on, you know, on, a, on a collection looking for a document, I rather than me try to figure out what the cardinality is for indexes, just pick each one at random and see which one's the fastest, right? So again, we're going to discuss more about this next week. Again, the way what we need to think about this is the cost model is the objective function we're going to have in our search strategy, and it'll define whatever it is we're trying to optimize for. For an in-memory database, it's typically going to be the size of the intermediate results is what we're going to de depend on, right? how much data we're we actually processing. And that ends up being a good um, uh, sort of high-level aggregation of possibly low-level things like the amount of CPU or network I'm using. right? But certainly, if you're having a disk-based system, uh, you know, whether you're doing random reads or sequential reads, that can make a big difference. And again, we'll see this more uh, next week. All right, so now if we want to implement a, an optimizer. There's four things we have to actually consider, right, of how we're actually, the things we need to care about when we're building this thing. So we'll talk about each of these. Op optimization, granularity, timing, how to handle prepared statements, and plan stability. So optimization granularity is essentially the sort of, what is it we're actually optimizing? Right? And so in the first case here, it's a single query, meaning like the application sends a single, single SQL, SQL statement, and I'm going to do, I'm going to optimize that, that SQL statement or generate a plan for that single SQL statement as if it's the only thing executing in my system, meaning I don't, I'm not consider any other query at, this, at the moment I'm doing my optimization. Right? And the advantage of this is that it's a much smaller, small, much smaller search space because I only need to care about what, what do I need to do to optimize my one query here. Um, the downside is that now you can't actually reuse any of the information or knowledge you gain about how you optimize that query. It's difficult to uh, apply that knowledge to other, other queries running you know, at the same time. Now you can, you can handle this with prepared statements, but that, they, that has other issues we'll see in a second. Um, and the, if you want to account for, as you generate this, the query plan for this single query, for account for other queries that could be possibly running at the same time, Right? And you have resource contention, like you know, if every query takes all the memory in the system to run, then that, you're going to run out of memory. Um, in order to handle this, you, your cost model needs to account for what are the other queries that are running at the same time and what are their resource demands. So you guys missed the Vertica talk on, on Monday after class, but one of the things they talked about in their system is that in their query optimizer, they keep track of what other queries are running at the same time, and if they know that they'll run out of memory, uh, for the query that they're actually planning at, at that moment, maybe they, they'll allocate it with, with less resources. And they can actually can dynamically change that uh, as the query executes. The other choice for your granularity is to do multiple queries. And the idea here is that you're given a batch of queries all at once, and you generate a, a global optimal plan uh, for all those queries. Right? This, can, this case here, it would be a local optimal. And in this case here, you could generate a global optimal. Um, as far as I know, no system actually really does this except for in the context of like streaming systems or continuous query systems where you're given the queries ahead of time. Like you want to you get, get an alert when the stock price dips below some amount, and that's sort of always running in the background. So you provide these things ahead of time. Um, it's challenging because the search base is much larger because now you're just not optimizing one query, you're optimizing all the queries together, and your cost model needs to account for that. Um, the, 
only one example I can really think of outside of streaming where this, this is useful is to do a technique or optimization called scan sharing, um, where say you have a query shows up and wants to do a sequential scan on an entire table. For this, assume we're doing a, a disk-based system. So one, the first query is going to do a sequential scan, read every single block in your table, and then say it gets about halfway through, another query comes along and wants to do the same sequential scan. Rather than that second query starting from the beginning and following along with the other one, it instead jumps ahead to where the first guy is running, scans along and reads the same data that it's, used, it's reading, and then just knows that when, the, when it reaches the bottom and the first query is done, the second one's got to loop back around and miss, get all the things that it missed the first time through. This is technically usually not done in the, in the optimizer, but it could be done because if, if you know what other things are running at the same time. Um, this is typically usually done at, at, at runtime, but the, the idea is the same, right? Trying to, trying to generate a query plan that can account for other things running at the same time. The next is the timing, essentially when do we actually do our, when do we actually run our query plan or optimizer? Um, and what most people think about is doing in the, it was called static optimization. This is like when the query shows up in the system, at that exact moment, I'm gonna generate, I'm gonna run my optimizer and generate a query plan for this, right? This is what pretty much everyone implements because it's the easiest thing for sort of humans to reason about and write code for. Um, the plan quality is obviously dependent on the cost model accuracy. If your cost model is way off, as we'll see next week, then you're, you're going to generate uh, bad plans. Um, and this is this can be expensive to do, right? Because we're trying to do this sort of in real time. Like someone submits a query, and we want to actually generate the plan at that moment. Um, to avoid this overhead, you can amortize the cost of uh, generating, you know, running the optimizer for every single query by using prepared statements. But as we'll see in the next slide, this, is, this has other problems. The next choice is actually to do dynamic optimization. And this is where you generate an initial query plan that's, that doesn't be super optimized. But then you start executing it. And as you're executing it, you, you, you select what you actually refine the plan further and try to optimize the operator you're ex executing on the fly. Right? So if I'm doing, uh, if I'm doing a join, uh, and, I'm, or, and I have to scan two tables, maybe I recognize that halfway through that I really want to be scanning this table using this other index instead of this, the one I'm using now. So I go ahead and sort of restart the, the operator and use maybe a faster access method, right? So this is really hard to implement. Uh, it, we'll see one example where you can do this in Ingress, uh, but the way they did it is more or less a hack. Um, but so as far as I know, this is not that common. I think Greenplum talked about doing something like this and possibly Vertica as well, right? It's really kind of hard to do, right? Because you kind of need to like stop what you're doing as you're executing operator and then change your strategy. The last approach is to use the static, uh, hybrid optimization, right? And this is basically you compile using the static method first and then as you're executing, if you, if you recognize that you're, you're, you are, your cost estimate is exceeding some threshold for what's what's occurring in, in the real system when you actually run the, execute, the query optimizer, or when, as you run the query plan, then you sort of go back through and invoke the, uh, the query optimizer again, try to rely on what you've already done so far to maybe free some portion of the query plan, and then re-optimize the rest. Um, again, far as I know, I, I don't know if anybody does this. This is actually my, I think this is actually my, might be what Greenplum does. All right, so as I said before, the, this is the most common approach to static optimization. And uh, this is problematic for some things because if we're trying to do this as someone sitting at the terminal or the application is evoking query, right? We're you know we can't start executing the query until we actually have the query plan, right? So if we have to take thirty seconds to run a, to generate a query plan for a query that's going to run one second, then that's that's not a good trade-off, right? Maybe it'd been better to do planning for five seconds and have a query that runs for 10 seconds, right? Because in the aggregate, we're still better. But to, one way to avoid this is, is to use prepared statements, but prepared statements have problems. So let's say I have a really simple query here. I'm doing a three-way join between able, a, table A, B, and C. And uh, I have these predicates here where I, for the, each, the A, B, C table, they have a val column and I have some... Uh, I have some uh, inequality expression I want, or, or uh, greater than expression I want to run. So every single time I invoke this query in my application, I got to replan this entire thing, even if I execute it over and over again. So the way, to, the way to avoid this is use prepared statements where I can take that query now, 
tell the data system, hey, I'm going to execute this thing. It gives it a handle, my query. And then whenever I want to execute it again, I just say execute my query. Right? What's the problem with this approach? I've hard coded these values in here, right? So this works great if I'm just executing this one query over and over again. But let's say instead of executing, you know, with you know val greater than 100 or val greater than 99, I want I want something else. Well, now I can replace this with uh, variables or, or placeholders where I can inject values at runtime. So now when I invoke this query, I can pass in like an RPC call. I can pass in the values that I want to substitute in here. What's the problem with this now? What's that? Exactly, right. So the question, so he said the cost may change, right? So at this point here, when I'm actually trying to generate the query plan, right, the big question I need to figure out is what's the join order I want to use for, uh, for this query? And so before, when I, was, when I had this, I could figure this out. What's the actual optimal way to, to, to order these things? But when I have uh, placeholders, I don't actually know uh, what these values are. Because I haven't been told, because I, I, you know, I have placeholders in my query, so I don't know how to actually optimize this thing, right? So there's three choices to how to handle this. The first is that you just run the optimizer again for every single invocation of your prepared statement, right? And the naive thing to do is just again just run it from 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 the from scratch every single time, but then essentially defeats the purpose of a prepared statement. So you can try to reuse the existing plan, like start with an initial plan, or the last time you ran the query, uh, start as that as a starting point, and then try to maybe refine it further for the, the exact invocation you're dealing with. But this is, this is non-trivial to do. It's not easy to do. The alternative is to maybe then actually generate multiple plans for different possible values of these input parameters, like maybe take buckets, like deciles or quantiles, and say take the average one for each bucket and generate a plan for that. Then when the application invokes that query, you look at the input parameters and say, well, it looks like these other, uh, these other possible values I've seen before and I have pre-generated plans for it. Let me use those. But now the problem is the, the number of possible plans you have to generate could be exponential, right? Because you may not have exactly the same bucket lineup uh, or use the same exact buckets for every single invocation. And then the last approach is essentially just take an average value for every single parameter. You look in the catalog, look at, look at the, the, the statistics you generated for each column, and just take the average one and then generate that one query plan and hope that it's actually good enough uh, for, for, you know, for the, every single time you invoke it. So most systems actually do this last one. I think this is what Oracle and uh, IBM do. I think SQL Server does the middle one. Um, and actually, I think Postgres probably does this one as well. Yes? Can we just like get an object function from like the optimization and just put those arguments into the function together? Your, st your statement is: Can I just take the objective function, yeah, objective the cost model, get the cost model, and do what? Sorry. And just put those arguments and get the results back. So it's, his statement is: Can I just take these? Take like this my query. This is my query. This, this is my query plan. I have a prepared statement. This is the query plan for the prepared statement. Yeah, and uh, like generate a cost model or like the object function for the query plan. And when the arguments change, just put the arguments into the. So his statement is um, generate this query plan, right? And then at runtime, when I invoke the query, take these parameters. Substitute in here and then run this through the cost model? It won't work. Right? Okay. So the last thing is what's called plan stability. And so this is really important in enterprise environments this is because the basic idea is that you don't want wild fluctuations in the performance of your database system, right? Performance of your query optimizer. Meaning if I have a query plan, if I, if I have a query and I run it through my optimizer today and it takes 10 seconds. The next day, I don't want it to take you know one second, and the next day after that, it takes a thousand seconds, right? Ideally, I, I want to have uh, stable runtimes, and so if we need now need to be able to optimize or, or, or upgrade our system, right? We want to go from from Oracle 10 to Oracle 11. Uh, we want to make sure that again we don't have wild fluctuations in our in our query plans for some percentage of our application, right? 
it's okay to upgrade to a new system and then have everything get faster, but if, if, if it's 75% 75 of your queries get faster, then 25% get, get much slower, people will notice that and people will complain. So we want to have a way to make sure that our, our optimizer over time can may not generate the most optimal plan, but at least it's, it's stable. So the first way to do this is to provide hints to the optimizer. Essentially, the DBA can extract or export the query plan. Uh, think of like a prepared statement, and then go in and annotate that query plan to say, oh, you should you know, use, use this index for this, this table scan, use this join algorithm for that join, right? and then load that back into the system. And then now when, every time you invoke the prepared statement, it, er, the optimizer relies on those hints to, to, as, it, as it generates the query plan. The next choice is actually to be, be able to support all different old versions of your query optimizer and cost model in every single new iteration of the database system. So the Oracle is actually pretty famous for this. So if you buy, I don't know what the latest version of Oracle is, 14 or 15. If you buy Oracle 14, they actually include in the binary the optimizer for Oracle 13, 12, uh, 11, you know, and 10, all these older versions. And you can select as the administrator to say, I want to use you know, Oracle 14 with the Oracle 12 query optimizer. And the reason is because the DBA would have vetted the query plans that the earlier version of Oracle generated and they know that it's going to produce reasonable results and they don't want to switch over to a new version without making sure that everything is, is, is tested. The last approach is to support backwards compatible query plans. The basic idea here is that you can export out as an XML file your query plan and then when you upgrade to the new version of the system or make a change to, to, the, op, to, the, to the system, you can then load those, those query plans back in. Um, and it'll be fixed for the prepared statements. And that way you know they ran well before and they'll run the same on the newer version. So we're not gonna really worry about any of this in our discussion today, because it's really how do you actually build the optimizer. But these are some things you need to keep in consideration if you wanna actually run this in, in a real system. Right? And this is also the reason why the optimizers in most database systems are like the most untouched piece of code uh, of the entire system because nobody wants to, to break something or have some weird uh, uh, you know, regression in performance you know, for some class of queries you didn't think of when you're trying to speed up some, something else. So plan stability is, is, is an important thing. That we, yeah, I think it sort of goes beyond just performance and software engineering. All right, so now again, we, we can start talking about the search strategies. So I'm going to talk about five different approaches here, uh, heuristics, heuristics and cost models, and randomized algorithms. Um, the two we're going to focus on the most at the end are the stratified search and unified search. And again, cascade, the cascades model you read about is an example of the unified search model. So to sort of think of this is again, going through the history of query optimizers, and you'll see why we ended up with uh, where we're at today. Now, also, the cascades model is from 1990s. Starburst is from uh, late 1980s. But these are still considered to be state of the art, right? You'll see this on the, the paper you read next Wednesday. SQL Server uses the Cascades model, uh, at, least, at least it's purported to, and it actually is phenomenal. It is much better than every, everyone else, right? even though it's based on a, you know, a, a search model, a search strategy from before you guys were born. Right? It's sort of like Quicksort, right? Quicksort, no one has come up with a better version. It's you know, from the 60s. It's good. Right? All right, so the, the first strategy is use uh, heuristics. And as I said before, this is pretty much, pretty much what everybody implements when they build a new database system and they need to, need to have a query optimizer. This is the approach everyone, everyone uses. And this is what you know, we ended up using up until, until last year. So the basic idea is that in the code itself, you're going to define some static rules that can transform the logical operators in a query plan into physical operators. Right? As I said before, the logical operator would say, I want to join table A and B. A physical operator will say, I'm going to use a hash join algorithm to join table A and B. And so there's sort of four standard things or, 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 or rules that everyone's going to implement. Right? So you have higher level things, like you always try to do the most restrictive filter as early as possible in the query plan, or you provide do all your filters and, and, and before you actually do joins. And this is obvious because you want to reduce the amount of tuples you have to consider during the join. Um, standard things like predicate pushdown, limit, and projection pushdown, um, and then deciding how to order the, 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 the tables when you do joins based on the cardinality. So the key thing to point out here is there's not a cost model in here. 
right? We can, we can just have all of this code in the system that can run and just apply these rules statically without ever having to worry about um, you know, comparing two different plans. So this was the approach that actually was used in the first version of Ingress, which I'll talk about in the next slide, uh, and actually was used by Oracle up until the, like, the mid-1990s, uh, which is actually pretty impressive. Um, and so you think about how, how did Oracle get so big and so popular and so wealthy uh, when they were using the most naive version of the query optimizer, when I said the query optimizer was one of the most important parts of, of the database system. Um, and it's important to remember back in the 1990s, right, think, like, think of like, the applications having to support like SQL 92. Right? SQL 92 has basic selects, joins, filters, predicates, aggregates. It doesn't have all the complex things that we have in SQL today, like Windows func window functions and CTEs. So the complexity of the queries that they had to support back in the day was not nowhere near as challenging as they are now. And also the, the size of the databases were much smaller back then as they are now. Right? The query optimization really, really starts to matter when things get really big and get more complex. So I, I've been told that Oracle got really far with their query optimizer. Uh, it was an impressive piece of code, but their issue was that it was it was near impossible to like extend or modify, uh, even though Oracle had a you know large team of people working on this. Um, and so they eventually abandoned it and they switched over to the stratified search model, which we'll talk about uh, in, in a bit. So for this class, the running example I'm going to use as we go along uh, is from this sample database. It's sort of modeled after like Spotify or like iTunes, where you keep track of like music. Right? So you have a table of artists and a table of albums. And then you'll have a, a cross-reference table called a peers that has foreign key references to do these. So the idea is here, you want to keep track of, for every album, what are the artists that, that appear on it. So let's say now, if we want to go through an example of how the ingress optimizer worked, uh, let's say we're going to use this sample query here, where we want to do a three-way join between artist, appears, and album. And we want to get all the, all the artists that appeared on the mixtape I dropped uh, two years ago in the database group. Right? We want to get them to, to show up uh, through this join. So Ingress is going to use heuristics to rewrite all the join queries that, that they have to execute into single table selects. The reason why they do this is because Ingress in the 1970s didn't support joins. So they would use heuristics to transform the, the, the query plans uh, into multiple query plans that all would do single table selects and then mash those results together to, to produce the join, right? So in the first step, what they're going to do is they're going to decompose this, this uh, join tables, join queries into single table, single variable queries, right? So take for, say, for example, the first part we want to join on album, we're going to extract out the lookup on album uh, where we do the lookup on the name of my, of my mixtape, and then we're going to have the output of this query be put into a temp table. And then we're going to rewrite the second query. Now, instead of referencing the album table, they're going to reference the temp table I'm generating here. right? And then now what they're going to do is do this rewriting again, take this guy, and now and rewrite that into uh, two separate tables, or two separate queries again, where the first one is taking doing the join with the first table generated here, and the, the third query here is, is doing a join with the, the second query here. So now they're going to actually start execute this. Right, I said they don't support joins, so the way they're going to be able to handle this is that as they execute uh, going from the top to the bottom, they're going to take the output of one query and then feed that as an input parameter to the second query, and so on. Right, so say we execute this first query, and it produces an album ID uh, 9999. And so now in the second query, we're going to extract out where we do the, the join on the temp table and just replace that now with uh, where album ID equals 9999. So think of this as a for loop on this table and this query here. For every single output, we're going to then uh, modify, rewrite this query here and substitute the, uh, the, the input parameter with whatever value we've generated above it. Right? And we do the same thing for, for the next guy. So this guy will produce an output Say it's artist ID one two three and four five six. So again, for four loop over those those results, and then we'll generate two separate queries here that substitute the uh, artist ID with the output of this query here. All right. 
So they're essentially doing query planning on a, like a per tuple basis, right? Because for every single time you, you invoke this, you can run it through their heuristics to do, you know, do query optimization, like right? selecting what index to use, right? So this seems super inefficient, right? Uh, but you have to understand, like back in the 1970s, uh, the harbor is really limited, so they weren't really operating on complex databases. In fact, the Ingress paper where this sort of example comes from talks about operating on a table with 300 tuples, right? That's nothing. Uh, so it, it'll work in that environment, but if you, you, know, you go to a billion tuples, this, this is certainly going to be slow. Yes? Does two queries like uh, like two scans? So his question is, do these two queries actually represent two scans? Absolutely, yes. So why they don't just like check uh, all, all these two values at the same time? Yeah, so, so his statement is, I could rewrite this to be artist ID in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Yes, you could do that. I don't, it, they probably didn't support in back then. Or, or disjunctions. All right, and then I produce my output here, right? So the advantages of the heuristic-based approach is that it's super easy to implement within reason up to a certain point um, because essentially it's always going to be almost a straight mapping from the logical plan to, to the physical plan. I need to do an index scan, Let me, or I need to do a lookup. I have an index. Here, use this index. All right? um, it's also easier to, to, to debug because there's no sort of complex search algorithm. It's going to, again, you can almost read the code going from top to bottom. And you know exactly what rules they're applying to generate the query plan. Um, and for the searchable queries, the real simple things, this works reasonably well. Um, and actually, it's going to be really fast because there's no cost model. It's always going to be these static rules and we just transform our query plan. Of course, now the downside of it, the reason why uh, this is a bad idea, is that it's really hard to extend and maintain, and it's going to be nearly impossible to generate good, good query plans when there's complex dependencies between different operators, right? Joins, for example, or nested queries, CTEs. Right? There's no notion of, of, of cost in these, in these rules, and so it's not going to have a way to iterate over them and try to figure out, you know, oh, this is the right plan, and this is a better plan than another one. Another key aspect of this is that uh, what I call magic constants have to be essentially embedded inside the uh, in the set of these rules to help it make decisions about you know sort of hard coded thresholds, right? When 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 is the right time to use an index versus another one? So as I said, this approach was used uh, by Oracle and Ingress. So they represent two out of the three original relational database systems that were developed in the 1970s. Um, the third system was IBM System R. And you heard me talk about how great System R was uh, multiple times. And this is because there was, uh, they were building a new system from scratch. They got a bunch of people with PhDs in a room, and everyone carved off their own piece, and they sort of built that in the system. So one of the key things that came out of it, one of the major contributions that came out of the System R project, was their cost-based uh, query optimizer. And that was led by uh, Pat Selinger. And so this is the first example of a cost-based query optimizer uh, or planner in a relational database system. And again, back then, it was the ID they were competing against the IMS and IDMS, like the, from the, the Codiso guys, and they argued that the, 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 the database system would never be able to generate a query plan that was better than one was, that was written by humans. Um, and so those other systems didn't have uh, you know, a declarative language like SQL or Quell. Right? The, the, the programmer had to write the algorithms, had to do things. Right, there was no query optimizer at all. So the, this was the first attempt to show that, oh, you actually, in the same way you, you don't want to write assembly, you want to use a compiler, you don't want to write your, uh, your data processing algorithms yourself, your query execution yourself, you want to use a, a query optimizer. So the key thing about uh, how the system R approach is going to work is that it's going to use what is called bottom-up planning. And so the basic idea of this is that we're going to start with nothing, uh, and then we're going to sort of search up into the tree and build out our query plan to reach our final goal, which is the, the correct output that we want. Right? If you come from an AI background, this is also called forward chaining. And they're going to use a dynamic programming technique or divide and conquer in order to do this search from the bottom up. So as I said, this was what, what the, uh, was implemented in System R uh, in the 1970s. And then the first version of DB2 borrowed some code from System R. Uh, in the early, early 1980s, and so it also used the, the same same model. 
Um, and this is also pretty much the approach that's used in, as far as you know, in almost every major open source database system today. Right? This is essentially what Postgres does, what uh, MySQL does, and as far as I know, uh, what, uh, what SQLite does as well. So again, the idea is that you're going to have the same static rules that we saw in the, the last example, the heuristics. You're going to do some initial transformations, and then you're going to have a, a search algorithm to try to figure out the, how to refine that, the, the query plan further. So what System R is going to do is going to break up our query into blocks, and then going to generate logical operators for each of those blocks. And, that, and the way it's going to do that, so that, that, that's sort of done the heuristic part. And then for each of the logical operators that we, we spit out, then we're going to have our search algorithm to try to figure out uh, the, the correct physical plan for this. So, so it's going to iteratively construct a left deep join tree or search tree, or sorry, left, tree, left deep query plan tree um, that is designed to minimize the total amount of work that, that it takes to execute this thing. And so a left deep tree is when you have all the joins occurring on the left side of the query tree, right? So you, you say you join A and B, then the output of that join is then fed into a next join operator that might, that might join C. Right? So it's not coming down the right-hand side, it would be a, a right deep tree. Or a bushy tree would be, you could join A and B and C and D, and then the output of those two joins are then joined together. Everything's always done as a left deep tree, because that was the optimal thing to do for the hardware they were dealing with back then. And it also cuts down the search space, the number, number of different query plans you have, to, you have to process. So let's go through an example of what System R does. Right? So I'm going to use that same query before, where I was doing a lookup on my, on my mixtape, but I'm going to add a little extra pit here where I'm going to say I, I need my output to be sorted by the artist ID. And this will come up, this will matter when we actually see how the algorithm works. And you'll see how uh, the cascade model or the unified search model deals with this in a, more, more, uh, in a better way. So the first thing I'm going to do is now you got to look at all the tables I'm going to access and choose the best access path or access method for them. Right? So in this case, example here, for the artist and appears table, I don't have an index. Assume, assume I don't have an index, so I'm just going, to, just going to do a sequential scan. But then for my album table, I want to do uh, use an index to look up on the name, the name column, right? And this selection here is based on 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 heuristics. So then the next step is now to iterate or enumerate all the different possible uh, join orderings we can have for these tables, right? So you can join artists and appears followed by album, or appears and album followed by artists, right? Basically, you know every single possible permutation of this, um, doing natural joins, as well as Cartesian products. Right? Those are technically still valid join, join approaches as well at, at a logical level. Um, in the case of System R, at least in the original version of it, they pruned out anything that was a Cartesian product, so they said that they were useless. That's actually not true so much in today's time, because there are some workloads where Cartesian products are, are useful, like doing deduplication, right? <laughs> trying, to, trying to do data cleaning, you actually may want to do this. But for our purposes here, just assume that system R would prune them and then we, we don't have to consider them. So then now what you need to do is you want to determine which of these is actually the right way uh, to join these guys based on what join algorithm you want to use. Right? So you can sort of again think of this as a, a search tree. Say this is the bottom, right? This is where we're starting with, where we have the three tables, artist appears an album. We haven't joined them yet. And then over here is the goal where we want to be. Where to be. We want to have an output of a query where artists and appears and album are, are joined together. And so we're going to go from now from this side to this side and try to figure out what the what the, the optimal path is, right? So what you do is, uh, and also assume that all the other join enumerations that I showed in the last slide are just listed down here. I'm, I'm not showing them to keep it uh, simple. So each of these edges now in our in our search represents a physical operator or physical execution of, of, the, of a join. So we can say we want to do a hash join or a cert merge join. And then we, we specify how we're actually joining these together. So for this here, this, this, at this point here, we'll have a logical operator that says we have an album is joined with the peers and an artist still hasn't been joined yet. Whereas the top one, an artist is joined with the peers and we haven't joined album yet. And so we have sort merge join edges and hash join edges for both of these. So now we use our cost model to say, to, to do this operator, how much, you know, what is the cost of actually executing it? In the case of system R, it was all about how much data you read from disk. And in an in-memory system, it could be how much, how much data I'm actually processing. Or how much data is this thing going to spit out? So let's say, again, we run a cost model for each of these approaches, and that these are the two edges that have the lowest cost. 
So then now we start from, from these two operators here, and we want to say, what are the different ways we can join them, uh, a, do a join that gets us to our final output here? Right? And the same thing, we have different join alg algorithms we can use, and each of those have different costs. So then we end up picking one that has the lowest cost, Right? And then we can now work backwards and say, what's the path that, that got us here? So what's the problem with this example here? What's that? He says it searched everything. No, uh, you don't necessarily have to do that, but it, it, it's a divide and conquer approach. But the key thing that's missing here is that I said in the last slide that I added that order by clause. So that means my output needs to be sorted. But in the original system R implementation, and what I'm showing here, there's no notion of sorting, right? These operators don't say anything about how the data needs to look like, right? So the only way I can still handle sorting in this environment is I have to now put in my cost model some logic that says, oh, by the way, the final output needs to be sorted on artist ID. So if the operator generates an output that's sorted on artist ID, then I'm good to go. That's what I wanted, right? So the problem with this approach is now you have uh, logic in the cost model that is, is, is reasoning about what the query plan actually is and what the data actually looks like and what it needs to look like, as well as logic in the search optimizer, or so in the, the search strategy, to actually figure out uh, you know, whether something should be in that, in that sorted order or not, right? So in this case here, the 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 hash join may actually be faster. This path at the top may actually be faster uh, if I'm just looking at purely on a join basis. But the bottom one here will generate my data after the sort merge in the sorted order that I need for my query. So I don't have to do an extra quick sort over here or an external merge sort to sort the data after the hash join. I get directly sorted output from this. So this is actually the, has the, the lowest cost. But again, from the search strategy itself, that information is not conveyed in any way. I have to bake that into my cost model. Yes? In this case, like, we'll be, we'll be for ordering. So this question is, in this example here, what would be, call, what would be responsible for ordering? I'd have to add a um, extra heuristic to add in an order by operator here in, in order to produce that output. But like, it doesn't have any information about the C Correct, that's the whole point of this. So I'm saying this is, insu this is insufficient to do exactly what we want and I'm purely based on the search strategy, I have to bake in my cost model information about the physical properties of the data. Okay. So again, the advantage of this is that it usually finds a reasonable plan without having to do an exhaustive search, right? The, the, the downside is that um, we still have that initial phase where we're doing heuristics, so we have to then hard code our, our static rules, which can be difficult to maintain. Um, the, in the case of system R approach, left deep join trees may not always be the optimal thing in, in, in memory environment. It was okay in their, in their world, not so much in ours. Um, and then this last point here is that there's no point in this, in this implementation of this search model that it keep, can reason about the physical properties of the data that we expect in our output. So the, another class of, of algorithms uh, going forward uh, is to do a randomized algorithm. So this is a bit of a, a deviation from the normal history of, of query optimizers. Um, as, as I'll see in a second, as far as I know, the only system that actually implements this is Postgres. Um, and they, it's, it's, it's a special case scenario for them. But the basic idea is that instead of having like a branch and bound search uh, or a, a divide and conquer search algorithm, we're essentially gonna do a random walk over all possible query plans and just hope that after a certain amount of time, we stumble upon a good one, right? So you sort of keep going, keep running, doing this random walk until you, uh, you reach some threshold, say this is good enough, or you run out of time and you say, I'll take whatever the best one I've seen so far and I'll just execute it. All right, so I'll talk about two approaches how to do this. So the first paper that sort of talks about using a randomized algorithm for query optimization came out in Sigmod in 1987, where they were doing simulated annealing. So the basic idea here is that you use your heuristics, as we saw before, to generate an initial plan, and then you're going to compute a, uh, have these multiple rounds of taking random permutations of a query plan and switching something in, in it. Like, if I want to join A and B, 
I'll do a random permutation and, and decide to join B and A, right? And then what happens is for that, after, after your permutation, you ask the cost model, is this, you know, what's the cost of running this query? Uh, if it's better, then you, then you always take that change. If it's worse than what you've seen before, then you flip a coin and decide whether you actually want to keep that change and keep, keep sort of walking in that direction, right? And the idea there is like you, uh, it helps you, you, know, you, you can break out of local minimums by accepting a change at that moment looks like it's bad, but it actually may be better because it may let you get to a uh, query plan that you would not normally to get, be able to get, get to. Tricky thing though is of course, again, we have this problem where we have to bake in rules in our implementation to make sure that we reject any query plan that would violate the output correctness, right? So again, sorting is, is the big example here, right? So if we, if we do a permutation that, that produces an output that's not sorted, then we, we reject that and, and then try another permutation. The, the Postgres optimizer, as the, Postgres has a genetic uh, algorithm-based implementation um, that is used to select the join orderings uh, for queries. So Postgres essentially has two optimizers. It has the regular one that you normally get um, that's based on the system R approach, but it has this genetic algorithm that gets invoked if you give it a query that has more than uh, 12 tables, then they fall back and execute this thing. So the basic idea here is that you generate an initial plan, and then uh, you have these multiple generations or multiple rounds where you generate a bunch of random uh, query plans, and then you pick whatever, which one, you know, the top five or so that are the best for that generation, you then mash them together uh, and, 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 and you know, trade traits or genes between them, and then do another round of measuring the cost of, of, uh, of, of the, that, that new generation generated. Right? And the idea is that uh, by mashing together different query plans that uh, seem to be good, you may come across, uh, you know, there's maybe certain aspects of one that are really good and aspects of another are really good, and you sort of crossbreed them together, and you end up with one that's super good. Yes? How exactly do you mash together two query plans? The question is, how do you mash together two query plans? Say I want to join, uh, I want to join uh, three tables, A, B, and C. And so one query plan might say, hey, do a hash join on A and B. And then uh, another query plan might say, do, uh, do a, a nested loop join when you join the output of A and B with C. Right? And maybe that's the right thing for that second, second join. And the, and the other one uses another join algorithm for that second join. But the first join algorithm is correct for the first guy and wrong for the second one. You mash those two together, and you may get the best of both of them. So it's basically a randomized uh, swapping out of subcomponents. Yeah, so his statement is it's a randomized it's swapping out of subcomponents. Yes, that's that how genetic algorithms work, yeah. Um, right, so again, you just keep repeating this until you, uh, uh, until you run out of time. Um, and of course, again, you have to have, make sure that whatever, whatever it is that you're using to, to mutate your, your different query plans only generates valid query plans, right? They, they only generate correct results. So the advantages of randomized algorithms is that uh, it allows you to jump around the search space without having to exhaust a search, and they have, you know, they have the ability to break out of local minimums. Um, and it has low memory overhead to do this because you're not going to maintain the history of every single generation or every single permutation that you ever had. The only thing you need to keep track of is the, the best query plan that you've seen so far, right? And this is going to be a big problem. This memory overhead will be a big problem in Cascades because they're going to do a, a ton of transformations and you need to keep, in, you need to keep track of the, what they've seen so far. The disadvantages to this is that because now it's random, uh, it's now difficult to determine exactly why the, the optimizer ch chose a certain query plan. Um, it may just seem sort of like, you know, it's like black magic that it spit out something. Um, if we want to make sure that we generate stable plans, as I talked about before, then we have to do extra work to make sure that the randomized algorithm is actually deterministic. So Postgres does this. Postgres seeds a random number generator. So if I run the genetic algorithm on a query today, when I run it tomorrow, assuming the database is still the same, that it'll still generate the exact same query plan. All right? And then again, of course, we have to implement this, our correctness rules to make sure that we don't uh, generate a query plan that is, is producing an invalid result. So this last piece here, I keep bringing this up 
over and over again from the last three type of, of, of query optimizers because this is a big overarching theme about how you actually implement these things. Like, this is hard, right? And this is because writing these query transformations in a, a language like C++ or Java, um, it's hard to do correctly and it's hard to reason about whether we're actually generating proper query plans, right? Because there's no way to sort of formally verify that the rules are, are doing what they should be doing for a particular query. And the only way to test this is actually just build a fuzz, fuzz test generator or just randomly generating a, a ton of queries and keep throwing them into your query optimizer to see whether it actually ever produces invalid results. Um, but you can't be certain that it's actually doing the right thing. So as we'll see next, the better approach is actually to have a declarative domain specific language or DSL where we can write our rules in a way, uh, in, a high, in a sort of high level abstraction and then have a rules engine that we can then verify and understand, apply those transformations uh, and to produce proper query plans. So the way to think about this is rather than writing C++ code to generate all these transformations, we can write them in a sort of a, 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 a intermediate language and then have a rules engine actually apply them. And because we can reason about the, the rules we write in our intermediate language, and, and we can reason about our rule, rule engine being correct, we know that it'll generate query plans that are correct. So this is the category optimizers that are, in, that are, that are the state of the art now. And these are essentially known as optimizer generators. So the way to think about this is again, you write your rules in a language and, and there's a rules engine which will then invoke them and perform the transformations for you on your, uh, on, on, on your query plan. And the difference is now, we'll be able to embed the, the constraints we have about physical properties for the data that each operator is generating and, and ingesting can now be included in these rules and we can now embed that information now in, our, in, our, in the, the plan itself for the different operators. So no longer do we have to put logic in our cost model to say the data needs to be sorted, make sure it is, it can now be directly enforced in the, the plan itself. So there's two approaches to do, to do this. There's the stratified search, which is essentially doing planning in multiple phases. And then there's the unified search, where you it's a single uh, search space that can do transformations from logical to logical and logical to physical. Right? Whereas in the stratified search, you do logical to logical in the first stage and logical to physical in the second stage. Right, so, again, so stratified search is essentially what I said. Right. So the basic idea is that we're going to do rewrites on the... Um, uh, on, the, on the logical query plan using transformation rules. And for this one, we don't need a cost model because it's standard things like predicate pushdown where you know it's always the right thing to do and you don't care about whether th th there's another query plan that doesn't do predicate pushdown that could possibly uh, be faster, right? And then after we do this, then we can do another, uh, uh, we, another stage where we do the cost-based search to actually now convert our logical plan into a physical plan. So the first one is logical to logical, the second one is logical to physical. And you have separate rules for each of these. So the, the most well-known stratified search uh, optimizer is called Starburst, right, that, that, it all, that came out of IBM Research. So as I said, the, the, when they first built DB2, uh, they took the, the query optimizer of system R, the, that got them you know, going for, for, for a couple of years, and then after a while it became sort of a pain to maintain. And there were certain obvious, obvious limitations about what the system R optimizer could do. So a team led by Guy Lohman, who retired a year or two ago at IBM, they came up with Starburst. And the idea is, again, you have two stages. When the first stage, you can do rewriting uh, uh, using essentially rules that look like relational calculus. And then in the second phase, you can actually go now back and do the uh, a system R style divide and conquer approach um, to, to you know, come up with the proper join ordering for things. And again, we, the, the, the knowledge about what the data looks like is permeates throughout all these things. And so as far as I know, this is the, the DB2 still uses uh, the Starburst uh, query optimizer that developed back then uh, in, in the current version of the system. And this is, at a high level, this is essentially what Oracle does today. Yes? Do they have to off stage one in the scale of the queries? No, it's a logical plan. It's a logical plan. Uh, you get, uh, think of like a nested query. Yes. So you could have uh, 
the, the one SQL block would be the outer query, and then the, the inner query would be another SQL block. Technically, it's still part of the same query plan. It's just the way you're demarcating it. All right, so the advantages of something like Starburst is that this works well in practice, and you get good performance. Um, at least in the original version of the Starburst, as described in the papers from the, from the 90s, 80s and 90s, um, they had this limitation where it was hard to, to assign priorities for transformations, meaning it just sort of did them in random order or in sequential order, right? Where there may be some cases where you maybe predicate push down is the thing you always want to do first, and you give that higher priority than, than some other optimization. Um, the, the first stage also had problems where there was maybe cases where a a logical, logical transformation, you do actually would maybe consider that what, what the cost is. Um, and this was hard to do uh, in, in their approach. And then also sometimes you always had to go back to the cost model multiple times, um, which got to be expensive. And then the, again, this may have gotten better since then, but the original paper talks about how it was really hard for humans to write these rules because it was written in you know relational domain calculus, um, which is sort of unnatural for a standard system developer to write. They may, I assume they fixed this since then, but I haven't talked to Guy about it, and I haven't seen him in a while. Okay, so in the remaining time, I want to talk about the unified search model, right? And this is what the, the Cascades approach that you guys read about does. And the idea here is that rather than having two separate stages, we're going to have a single, single stage that can do both the logical to logical transformations as well as the logical to physical transformations all together, right? Everything is just written as transformations. And so the rules engine knows how to process them uh, as needed and knows about how to make sure things are, are always going to be correct. And so the major downside of a unified search model is that it's going to have do way more transformations because it, it may go logical, logical, or logical, logical, physical, right? It may try all these different combinations of transformations. And a lot of these end up, could end up being redundant. So to avoid having to go to the cost model over and over again, for the same repeated transformation, they have to use a, a memorization table to keep track of the, you know, the cost model estimate the last time you, you checked a transformation um, and consult that to sort of speed things up. So now before Cascades, there was a, another query, uh, a query optimizer called Volcano um, that was written by this guy Gertz Graffi. So this is the same Gertz Graffi from uh, the Volcano iterator model when we talk about query processing. He wrote the, the, lock, the locking latching paper you guys read for, for B trees. Right? It's the same dude. Yes? Is that memory same procedure? Is that across queries or just for C queries? His question is, is in, the, in the unified search model, is the memorization across queries or is it per query? It's per query. For every single query, you, you, we start with a fresh memorization table. All right, so, the, the, so Volcano was actually the second query optimizer that Gertz built. So there's a system before this called Exodus, um, which I think was, a, was sort of like, like the system R approach. And the lessons he learned from that, he then developed this, this query optimizer called Volcano. And the lessons he learned from Volcano is what he ended up developing as, uh, as Cascades, right? So the big thing that, that happened in Volcano is that uh, he's going to treat the physical properties of the data as first-class entities in our query plan, so again, we make sure that we consider them when we do our transformations. Um, and the idea was that they wanted to make it really easy to implement uh, new transformations and new equivalence rules in a system using a DSL without having to worry about you know, going and modifying the core, the core engine. Uh, you write these, the, the transformations in a separate place, and the rules engine can be implemented separately from that. So now, the unified search model in, in Volcano is me doing a top-down approach. And this is different than the bottom-up approach we saw in System R. And the idea here is that you start with, with the goal, or what you want, right? the correct output of a query. And then you work from the top down, and you start adding in the different operators to the query plan. And, and you estimate the cost as you go down, so you know how to avoid going down a branch that, that may not actually generate a, a good, good result for you. Right? And if you're coming again from an AI background, this is called a backward chaining. So as far as I know, the Volcano model was never actually implemented in academia. Uh, they implemented the Volcano, and then the, there's, in the paper they talk about a bunch of other academic prototypes at other universities that are using Volcano. 
But as far as I know, nobody actually implement, implements this. It's the cascades model is what everyone cares about. So real quickly, the, it's important to discuss the distinction between the top-down and the bottom-up approach, right? Because this, this is not the same as whether it's a stratified search or a uh, unified search model, right? They're, they're actually mutually exclusive. So again, the top-down approach, you start with what you want, and you work down from there. And so Volcano and Cascades are implementations of this that also have to be implementations of a unified model. The bottom-up approach is then you start with the bottom with, the, with nothing, and then you build up the query plan to get to the goal, right? And this is what System R uses and what Starburst is using. But there's nothing about uh, the top-down or bottom-up approach that doesn't say you couldn't use either one in a, a unified search model, as far as I know. This is what they just decided to, to go with. All right, so let's see how Volcano works. And this will look a lot like what Cascades does, but we'll discuss Cascades in more detail. So again, at the very beginning, you start off with what, what, result, what, you, what, you, what you want your result to be. Right? So I want a three-way join between a peers, artist appears and album, and I want my data to, to be sorted on the uh, artist ID. So then now we'll start invoking rules to do transformations to go either from a logical operator to a logical operator or logical to physical. Right? So logical, the logical would be join A and B can be converted to join B and A, and logical physical will say join A and B to make it do a hash join on A and B. And so here, here's, here's our logical operators, right? We have our, our, our join operators, and then we have um, their access methods, so what, what table, how we're gonna read the tables. And then now I'll start from the top, and I'll start saying, well, what do I need to do to get to these bottom guys here? So let's say that I wanna do a sort merge join on uh, the, the album table and the output of the artist and appears. And then going down from here, I can say I can do a hash join to get me to this operator here. And then now I have a full plan. I can evoke my cost model and say, you know, what's, what's the actual cost of executing this? And then likewise, for the, uh, to do this join, I could use a, a sort merger join instead, right? So the other important thing about Volcano and the unified search model is that we're going to have these enforcer rules that we can then uh, use to require that the input to an operator has to be in a certain form or have certain properties, right? So we have an enforcer rule that says the, any data we're given here to this top operator here, the root, has to be ordered by the artist ID. So that means that if I have a uh, hash join uh, operator here, I know that this output is not going to be sorted on it, so I can immediately prune it and say this, is, this, this violates my enforcer rule, and I don't need to look at anything below it. Right? I can stop it right there. Or I could have, say, over here, a quick sort, uh, say, invoke an order by with a quick sort algorithm on the, on the AID, and then I can have any joint algorithm could, could feed into that. Right? And again, I'm estimating the cost as they go along, so I can recognize that having to do this quick sort followed by a hash join is more expensive than having to do just a straight sort merge join. So I can kill this, this branch right here and not look out, look down any further. Yes? This question is how do you do a predicate pushdown? That's part of a transformation rule. Uh, it's logical to logical. You can, you can push it down to here. But you know that you always So his statement is, since you always need to, since you know you always want to do predicate pushdown, does it make sense to just do it as a heuristic first, then run through the search model? Let's discuss that in the context of cascades, right? It'll make more sense when you have groups and things like that. Okay, uh, in the sake of time, I'm going to skip this real quick. Um, the advantages of a volcano optimizer is that uh, we're going to use declarative rules to generate these transformations. Um, and it doesn't actually matter, the, the, the rules engine doesn't care whether it's a logical to logical or logical to physical. It's the same type of rule written in the same DSL and just applies them uh, as needed. Right? Um, and then we, we can reduce all the, the extra steps we have to do or extra invocations of the cost model by using the memorization table. So the disadvantage of, of Volcano and what Cascade solves is that the, all the possible equivalent classes, meaning like the different ways you can, you can permute a logical operator, are all expanded ahead of time 
at the very beginning, and th this explodes your, your search space. And what Cascades is going to be able to do is actually determine that on the fly, these are the different permutations I, I could possibly have, and only do that as it goes along, so it doesn't actually have to expand, you know, look at things that may not actually, not actually generate a, a good query plan. Right, that'll make more sense uh, next time. And then the sort of related to his, not really, not exactly what he was saying, how do you predicate pushdown, but how you actually do rewriting of predicates uh, was difficult to do in, um, in Volcano. All right, sort of rushing through this end, but to give you, again, the idea here that I want to show you and have appreciation for the different ways you can implement a search model. And then we'll see on, uh, on Monday in Cascades and, uh, and, and Orca, which is an implementation of Cascades through Greenplum, about how you actually you know, apply this technique in, in a modern system. So what are my main parting thoughts on this? Uh, should be clear that I think query optimization is very hard. Uh, there's a running joke in databases that says that if you fail at, at, at getting a job or doing well in query optimization, you can always fall back to rocket science because rocket science is easier than query optimization. Right? Um, that's, that's from David DeWitt. Uh, so this is hard. And doing it well and doing it efficiently is hard to do. And again, the Cascades model is just one way to sort of simplify the development of these things and make it easier to maintain uh, and extend as you want to support new features. So I would also say this is also the reason why the NoSQL guys, they claimed they didn't want to do SQL because they knew that if you had to do SQL, you had to implement a query optimizer. And they do that, and they just skipped it entirely. And of course, now they're going back and adding, uh, some of them are adding SQL, and they're most, as far as I can tell, most of them are doing a heuristic-based query optimization, or the, th the very th first thing we saw in the beginning, because that's where everyone starts, because it's easy. Okay? All right, so Monday's next class is more optimizers, right? First Blood part, part Two, which is a Rambo reference that no one gets at this point, because uh, it came out before you were born. That's okay. Uh, so we're going to talk about Cascades, we're talking about Orca and Columbia, right? Columbia is the master, in the master's thesis you guys read, is a implementation of, of Cascades. Orca is another implementation of Cascades, all right, from the Green Plum guys. And then we, we use, in Peloton, we use, we use the Cascades model as well. All right, any questions? You have a question, yes. Can you go back slide to 32? Very specific. Which one do you want, 32? Yeah. All right. Okay. All right, I know it's for you. So my question was like, oh, with this, uh, like the logical to the logical. What is what? Is, what, is what? So like, uh, we write the logical crude plane. Uh, yeah, that's cool. So like again, like I do I join A and B or join B and A? That's a logical logical transformation. Yeah. yeah do like produce a multiple of planes for selection in the next phase. In this phase here? Yeah. Well, so like a predicate pushdown is, is an example of a logical transformation you would do that you don't need the cost model. Because you know you always want to do it. The the joinery stuff is, is you need a cost model, and that's that's done in the second stage. Can I take it as like the most op the optimal like logical plane? At, that you get from this stage? Yeah. Question is do you does this produce the most optimal plan? Yeah, like the most optimal logical plan. Yeah. No. Because I can join A and B and jo or join B and A. At a logical level, there's going to be one that's better than another. All right. Any questions? Enjoy the snow. Mmm, money, something refreshing when I get finished manifesting. Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith and Wesson. One court and my thoughts hip hop related. Write a rhyme and my pen's intoxicated. Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor. Since I'm a city slicker, brain waves are quicker. Rhymes I create rotate at a way too quick to duplicate. Feel a breeze as I skate. Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight. When I'm in flight, then we ignite. Blood starts to boil. I heat up the party for you. Let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil Wreck still turns with third degree burn for one man I heat up your brain, give it a suntan So just cool, let the temperature rise To cool it off with St. Ives